Don't worry, I'm back, Phoebe. And uh, no, unfortunately, my friend was not able to get into the server, but if you do have a YouTube link, then I can share that with him. All right, and I think now we are ready to start. All right, I don't know if there's any formal introduction thing to do, but oh my gosh, I just... Excuse me, let me go back to the start. I need to... All right, there we go. <laughs> All righty. Yes, ooh, indeed, Kelly. Alrighty here, I think we're ready to get it started. Hi everyone, so my name is Jacob Wilson, I am a casting director. I'm going to go more in depth about what that is and how I came about that pretty shortly. So this is the ins and outs of casting. It's just sort of an in-depth look at not only what goes into a casting call, sending it out, like, you know, the whole process behind a casting call, sending it out and making the final picks, but it's also... More the nitty-gritty of what actually goes into a casting call. And also some tips at the end about voice acting and how to make sure your audition is not something that will be skipped over. Now, I am not going to guarantee casting. Anyone who guarantees casting or says that they can guarantee you that, that's a scam, so don't listen to them. But I will give you tips on how to make an audition that, at the very least, will get you to the next round. Sends like, you know, short list and stuff, but it will get you onto the next round. That much I can tell you. Alrighty. So, just a couple things. So, who the heck am I? So, my name is Jacob Wilson. I've been a voice actor for nigh on five years now. I've been a casting director for about three. Basically, how I started was I'm based in the Dallas area, and I found out that I actually live down the street from Funimation. And now they're in my hometown, which feels like a dare. But I found out about that, and I had interest in... I've always had an interest in acting since I was in middle school, and when I found out about voice acting, it seemed like an easy thing to do. So I started going to classes, and then I found out there was a whole online scene. And from there, I just started auditioning for things, like getting casting things, and then I just kept going until now. Some of the things that you may have seen me in, I have... Uh, acted in projects like Divine Speaker, where I play the main character. Same thing with My Burning Heart, I play the main character in that. I've also played uh, characters in XOXO Blood Droplets. I've also worked with Salty Universe as both casting, acting, and directing. I'm also a voice director for projects like Lucid Nine and Crossroads. And as you can see, I've cast for a wide variety of projects, from Witches and Warlocks to Sensations to Synthetic Lover, Lucid Nine. It's a lot of yaoi in my roster. All right. So, how did I get into casting? Well, it all started with actually the first ever project I was ever cast in, which was Divine Speaker. Basically, one day I was just talking with the devs, and I was very active in this project because I was very excited about it. And I wanted to just be involved however I could. And then one day the devs messaged me and said, Hey, can you help us with casting some of these roles and filling this out? I was like, Sure, I would love to do that. So, I initially was helping them just like taking the shortlist and stuff and then I eventually helped them make the final picks for these characters. And from that point on, they were like, hey, why don't you keep doing this with us? And I was like, absolutely, I would love to do that. So I was brought on as their casting director as well. That was my first time casting. Fun fact about uh, Divine Speaker actually. Divine Speaker was my first project, my first lead, my first paying role, and also my first BL. It would not be my last. But when it came to this and becoming the casting director, I also was made a part of their dev team. And because of that, I was brought onto this server, which was the BL dev server. And from there, I was introduced as their casting director. And other people started reaching out for me to cast their projects. And it just kind of went on from there. And from there, I made myself into a casting director, which also led into voice directing. But that is a panel made by someone more qualified than me. So, how do you make a casting call? Well, it comes down to three steps. The first step is actually making it. So, the building blocks, putting things together, and all the information and stuff that you want on there, put that together into a document, and then the second part of it is to actually send it out there. This will usually be the easiest part since most of the work is done by other people, but putting it in the right place for it to be seen, and then from there, other people see it and audition for it, and then once you have all those auditions, you get to the final part, which is to make the final picks. I picked this image because there's often so many options available, and it comes down to one. 
and how you pick that one, I'll get more into later on. But those are the three basic parts of the casting call. So let's actually break down how you make the casting call itself. Well, you have to first start with the characters you want. You can decide if you want to cast for a couple of characters or if you want to cast for the entire thing. I don't recommend that strategy depending on the size of the project because you don't want to overwhelm yourself too quickly, especially if you don't really need those rounds immediately. I've done a variety of them. For, when, for instance, Witches and Warlocks, which I'm going to be using as the main example of this, we did cast all at once because it was just seven rules. It was four side characters and the three voices of the main character. And then when it came to Divine Speaker, we actually cast incrementally over time because it's a big game and we didn't need all the rules immediately. So let's actually start talking about what you will include when it comes to the character. So when you actually have your character down, you want to write a little description about them, give people an idea of what they're about. You also want to include some visuals. Now, even if it's an audio-based project, I would recommend having some sort of reference for someone to base their voice off of, because a voice description can give you a lot, but actually having an image and something that people can put to the voice will help a lot in how they will craft the audition. You can include things like the age range of the character. You want to include things like their gender, vocal type. Vocal type really depends. I don't know how I feel about things like high or low or medium range because that varies from person to person, not only in what that sounds like, but also in how they will interpret it. If you do have a specific sound you want, then have a reference of some kind. For example, I recently cast for Limelight, and there was a character we cast for and the director actually had a specific sound in mind. They wanted Jane from Tarzan. Specifically, they wanted the line when she goes, He was such a wild man! <laughs> and we wanted that sort of intonation. So we included a link to that so that the actors could get an idea of what we were wanting specifically, and that helped auditions further on. This is also where you can include things like if you have an accent preference, if you want them to have a British accent, or maybe even Romanian. Also mentioned their ethnicity if you wanted to do something more specific or go more representational with that. But that's something I can answer more in questions later on. If you have that. And things like the age, I would recommend having it, even though it doesn't ultimately define the voice because, you know, I've heard 13-year-olds sound like they've had three puberties. But I do recommend having it so people have an idea of what they're supposed to go for. Basically, the description of the character and their voice is just all what you have in mind and what you think is going to help people get to that. I recommend having an idea of what you want in your head, so when you're later casting, you know what you want to build up to. You can be surprised later on. That certainly has happened a lot. I've had some instances where I was actually surprised by the auditions myself, but it's always good to still have an idea in your head of what you want. Now, when it comes to the three lines here, I actually quite like this because you see the emotions alongside them. Sometimes it can't always be that flashy. It entirely depends on how much visuals you want to put into your casting call. But when it comes to the lines, I recommend having at least three. And when you do those three, I recommend that those three have a variety of emotion. Something I often see when it comes to casting calls is that people will have the three lines, but the three lines will have very similar emotions. And when that happens, you're not really gauging how well the actor can actually play the part. For example, Divine Speaker, when I auditioned for that role, the three, the lines that we had, it was more than three, but the lines were still very similar in emotion. And then when I actually got into the project, these are not really spoilers, but my character gets tortured, my character has death screens, my character cries their eyes out, they go through a whole emotional spectrum. And thankfully, I was ready for that, I was able to do that, and we had an amazing director in Amanda Hufford. But if an actor is not prepared for that, then there's a chance that they won't be able to do that when the time comes. And you can do all you can to get them there and certainly help them there, but it is best for you to know from the start whether or not the actor is able to do that. So if they um, cry their eyes out, then have a crying scene. If you don't want to have anything that spoils the project, you can write your own lines. That's certainly been a thing done before. But for the most part, if the character has a variety of things that they go through, I'd recommend having something that shows the highs and lows of the character just so you know that the person who's auditioning can do that for you. Okay, so that's when it comes to the character themselves. But furthermore is also 
the information involved. Now, this information is going to involve things like the deadline. When it comes to the deadline, also, hold on, let me just adjust this for myself. When it comes to the deadline, you generally want to include a couple things. You want to have a deadline that I'd say, I'd say you should have like a two week deadline. The reason why I say two weeks is because two weeks is enough time that if people aren't able to get to it immediately, they'll still have time to do it. But it's not so long that they can wait to the last minute. For example, with Witches and Warlocks, we actually gave a month. But what we found out happened there is a lot of people would audition, but they will wait until the last minute because it's something that they say, oh, I have a month, I can take my time. But then when they actually go for it, they realize that time has gotten away for them and they all send it to the last minute. And what ended up happening there was that on the final day, we had 400 emails. Not auditions, emails. And we were going through the emails as they were coming in to download the files and move them into our Google Drive so that it'd be easier for us to look through it later. But what that ended up doing was on the last day, we actually crashed our account three times, which significantly hindered the process because it took hours each time in order to get it back. So two, out, two weeks, I would say, is a good length of time for you. You also want to include things like the payment. The payment is going to be based on a variety of factors, and it really just comes down to your budget and length of the project. The longer the project and the more work that has to go in, the more you will pay. I generally recommend something like $0.25 cents to $0.30 cents per word. I don't really like the per line method because a line can be anywhere from, like, say, for example, it's this thing that says $2 a line. Well, what is a line? A line could just be a simple hey, or it could be a whole monologue. So in order to better quantify that for me, I prefer the per word method. Now, say that you have a director or that you're going to be directing them and it's going to be more like an hourly thing, you can do a per hour rate. Standard issue is like $60 to $75 per hour. You can also include a minimum in there. Just make sure you are fully transparent with the budget so that anyone who auditions for you knows what they are auditioning for, how much they'll get, and it's also just to cover yourself. The general information section is just to make sure you cover all the bases that you need to. You can also mention if there's going to be more funding down the line, like a Kickstarter, and also how you will dish payment. Also, if you are going to direct them, the method you will do so. Like if it's going to be through Discord or Skype or Source Connect or what have you. One of the most important things you will include in here is also the naming convention. First, you want to know what you're going to have the email subject line be, because then later on when you have to look for things, it's going to be a lot easier to be like, okay, so this is what I need to find in this flood of emails. This is how I know this is an audition. And the naming convention. Typical naming convention I would recommend is the character name, underscore, and then actor's name. I do this because later on when you have all the auditions listed, it's all in sections. It's all in sections of the character itself, and it's a lot easier for you to find them all and just go down the list that way. This is going to be, this is just to make it easier on you. And also, if people don't follow this naming convention, you know they didn't pay attention, so. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds a bit harsh, but trust me, when you have as many auditions as you will get, like with Witches and Warlocks, I got 2,000 auditions for seven characters. So anything you can come up with that will narrow that number down for you quicker will help you a lot. You also want to mention how you want the audio to sound. This is something that's a very tricky thing. I'll get more into that later. But when it comes to the audio, you generally would want audio that sounds clear. It doesn't have to be like broadcast quality, but you don't want like any bad background noise or any reverb or static or anything like that. When it comes to an online project, you want to make sure the audio all sounds, sounds like it's coming from the same place to make it a lot easier on the viewer and also not to break immersion. And, you know, obviously not everyone's going to have the same microphone, but if you start from the same base of not having any of that static or anything like that, it's a lot easier for you to mix it to sounds like it's coming from the same place. And at the bottom, you can also include things like hey, you don't have to be the same gender or age that the character auditioned for them. This is generally like a common sense thing for a lot of people, but you can include that if you want. Also, also there's any additional lines. Like, for example, at the bottom it says, give your interpretation of the character's trick-or-treat. You can mention that. And also, just wish people the best of luck. 
Another key thing I would say with the casting call, this is more of a superficial visual thing. The nicer you can make it look, the better. I say that because we are visual Humans are a visual species, and if they see something that looks nice, they're a lot more likely to go for it. So if you can include concept art, or if you can include a cool title card, or just make things look nicer, it also gives off the air that your project is more prof professional, and it'll help you a longer way when it comes to the actual casting process. Alright, so now that you made your casting call, you gotta get it out there. This will generally be the easiest thing for you, because once it's out there, the voice actors are gonna come for it. So you don't have to worry about constantly having to push it because generally people are going to share it themselves. But how are you going to get it out there? Well, there's a couple ways you can go. Voice acting servers, for example, VAC is a really great one. The great thing about that place is it actually separates it based on if it's paid or unpaid, original or fan. So you know what to look for and it makes it a lot easier for you to find things that way. I know Twitter is kind of a hellscape right now, but... <laughs> It still is a great place to find voice actor, voice acting casting calls because that stuff can be retweeted and shared by other people, and it's a lot easier for it to spread that way. I often use Twitter to share it there and also retweet other casting calls that I find. So that's another great source. Also, something like Casting Call Club. Casting Call Club is something that I, I like it. I don't really like how you see the other people's auditions. I feel like that that can give other people anxiety and they end up comparing themselves, especially like the like system. I don't really feel the best about that. But for the most part, Casting Call Club is a great source if you um, want something that gives you more of a template of how to make your casting call. I like the Google Doc personally, but Casting Call Club is also a great resource if you want to make your casting call through there and also if you want to find them. All right, so now you've gotten it out there, and now it comes down to the big question. How do you make your final pick? You have all these auditions now, you've curated all these auditions, so now the big question is, how do you actually go down to the final person? One second. I know it's big, I stay hydrated. <laughs> so the first thing you can do is, there's a couple of general things you can do to cut down on some auditions. For instance, audio quality. Audio quality will often be the biggest thing when it comes to an online project. Now, if you're, say, going into a studio and you're going to be recording from there, then audio quality isn't really that big of a deal because it's not going to be indicative of how the final thing is going to sound like. It could probably make the audition sound a bit less clear, but for the most part, it's not going to matter there. However, if it's online and this is the audio source that the person is going to be using during the actual final project, you want to make sure it sounds good. So if you can hear the mic feedback before you hear the actual audition, that would be a cancel. If you hear static or background noise, or if there's really bad reverb or echo, or if it just sounds very muddy, if the audio quality is not that clear, then that would be another, those would be other signs to X on the audition. When it comes to having a lot of auditions, you want things that can really make the cutting down process a lot easier, and oftentimes audio quality will be the first thing to, you will notice and the first thing to know whether or not you're going to skip on it. After that comes the actual quality of their acting, which, by the way, I just noticed that this microphone is not actually attached to anything, so I don't know what this kid is screaming at. But their acting ability. Can they sell the part? Are they selling the lines? Are they having a voice that matches up? If the acting is not really up to the snuff of what you need, or the voice doesn't really sound like it's matching what you have in your head, or it's not working for you, then that'd be another skip. So audio quality and acting ability, those are the two most obvious things that you can skip on an audition for, but now what? How do you actually make the final pick? Because you've weeded out all of the obvious ones that didn't work, but now you're left with a lot of ones that could, so how do you decide? Well, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes you just get a big, bright light bulb moment, and there's only one that you want, and it was the standout from the start, and you know immediately that that's the one you want. But for the most part, you're just going to get a lot of light bulbs. This is just going to be the common thing that happens with a lot of casting calls, because there's so many people who could do the role and do the role well, but there can be only one at the end of the day. So how do you make the final pick? Well. This is where basically you have to get nitpicky. You are like, 
hmm, you know, I don't really like this person's cadence compared to this one, or I like the way this person read the line, or their voice is deeper than I really want. It's going to sound petty. It's going to sound really petty. But that's what you'll have to do in order to narrow down hundreds of auditions to the one final person. And the great thing about that is once you make that final pick, you'll know that that person truly was the best one you could have gotten. There are also other kinds of casting calls out there. Sometimes you can just do direct messaging to somebody. I've certainly had to do this before when we're on a really tight crunch, or if I just don't have the time to do a regular casting call. For instance, there was one casting call I did where we recast one of the roles because what ended up happening was we had new things happen because of audio quality. Now, when it came to that, I had somebody in mind that I knew could do the role, and I messaged them to see if they could do it, and thankfully they were able to. So that's certainly a thing you can do, and why it's also a good idea to keep track of different actors, keep track with them whether or not they're online or they've auditioned for your projects before, and you're like, hmm, I really like them, they didn't really work this time, but maybe for a different time in the future they could. So I would recommend keeping track of different actors. You don't really need a full roster. I see a lot of people making rosters today, and I don't really know how much they need it. But I do recommend keeping track of actors that you like, that you think could work for things in the future, because sometimes you won't have time to do any type of casting call, and it's good to have people in mind that you can reach out to. Other than that, there was also demo calls. Demo calls are things that I do quite a bit, but I do it for certain reasons. For instance, I had one casting call where I had to cast the extras of a project, but there were 50 extras. <laughs> now, for the most part, you're not going to need to have 50 separate auditions in a casting call. It's a lot easier to just have a demo submission and you can listen to it from there. So I would do it for things like extra calls or minor roles that, honestly, the length of them would be the same length as the audition. So... I don't, need to do an, I don't need to do a regular casting call for that. I also sometimes do it for passion projects. I do work on free projects sometimes, and if you're going to do that, make sure that no one else in the project is getting paid, because otherwise they're scamming you. But if no one else is getting paid, if the project is free, and it just is something that looks good to you, and you like the team, things like that, then sure, go do a passion project. It's great. But what I find when it comes to passion projects is that people are a lot more likely to submit a demo than they are to audition for it. So I will sometimes do demo calls for these passion projects so I get a much wider reach out there. I did that for some game jam projects that I did. Now demos are great because it's a lot faster than a regular casting call. You know, it's a lot easier for someone to just submit their demo than have to make a whole new audition for it. And you can get the results a lot faster. Problems with demo calls is that, sure, with auditions, you may get a lot of files, but it's a lot of files that are curated to that one role. So you can compare everything to this role. But when it comes to demos, they're not curated to anything except archetypes, and not every demo will have the archetype that you specifically are in need of. So for the most part, you're listening to a lot of minute-long auditions, and for the most part in audition, I can usually hear within the first few seconds whether or not I'm going to listen to the rest of it or consider the rest of it. But I can't really do that with a demo, because I have to listen to the whole thing to know whether or not what I need is in there at any point. So, when it comes to demo calls, know that it's going to take a while, and just keep a good ear out for things. Also, you can call for specific samples if it is just an archetype, but demo calls are still a great way to go if there's just too many for a regular casting call, or it's just something that's easier for you. Okay, so I've talked about the casting call process, how to make it all that jazz. Now let's actually talk about auditioning. Like I said at the start, I can't promise that this will get you cast, but I can tell you what I've looked out for, what usually leads to me skipping an audition, and what you can do as to, at the very least, move on to the next round. So first off, bad audio. Bad audio is usually the thing that will knock you immediately from an audition. There's many ways to avoid it. Uh, I do want to let you know, you will probably have to spend some money, at the very least, on the equipment. However, the equipment is only... It's honestly a smaller part compared to the actual place you are recording in. What I've included here is a, is a place called voicemoto.com slash booths. 
That's one by a great guy. His name is Jun Yoon, if you've heard of him. I recommend checking out this website because you get samples of different at-home recording booths that were made in improv style or just with the basic things that were around them so that they had, excuse me, so that they had an idea of what to do. My setup, for example, is the one with the pink towel. Now, I saw a tier list. I still can't find this tier list, but this tier list has been used in many, co in many um, classes and things like that to talk about the different tiers of audio quality. At the bottom is like a PVC booth or blanket fourth with, say, an AT2020 and an Audient ID4, and that's like $400. And at the top is a Studio Bricks with a Neumann and Apollo Twin. And it basically says the higher up on the chain you are, the better. And that the one at the bottom is really only good for auditions and not good for anything else. Well, as someone who has recorded entire games and projects in that pink towel setup, I can tell you that that's just not true. You're not going to need to break your bank and you're not going to need to break your back on an expensive setup. You will have to spend some money on the initial equipment. I recommend, say, $100 to $150 for each will get you some really good stuff. But for the most part, when it comes to the actual soundproofing, just improvise with, with what's around you. For example, in my mom's closet there, I'm just using her, I'm just using the clothes. I have a thick blanket that I laid across the back wall. That pink towel is also acting as extra catch for reverb. Keep in mind, I am not a sound engineer, so I cannot give you anything specific. And this is just from my personal experience. But there's a lot of sources online you can find to make your audio quality sound better. I also sometimes use my dog's bed. I move that up into the corner, make like a little bass trap. But there's so many things you can improvise with around your home that you already have to help make your audio quality sound better. And then after that is, can you act it out? Now, ugh, there are so many ways to improve your acting from going to your local theater places to improv or making a little group with other friends of yours that are actors, taking workshops, taking classes, all that jazz. There's so many of those things that you can do to make your acting better. And I also will keep in mind that when it comes to the voice itself, sometimes your voice is just not going to be the best match for the character. Nothing personal, it just happens. As someone who has a rather unique cadence, this is something that I've experienced a lot, and I know a lot of other people experience this as well. But don't ever diss your natural voice. There's a lot of things you can do to change your voice, but when it comes to an audition, keep in mind that what you audition with is what you're going to have to go with because you need to make sure the audition matches what actually is the final product. So if you audition and you may be able to nail these three lines with the voice you've chosen, but can you go the entire emotional spectrum of a character with that? A friend of mine told me how... Mark Hamill's Joker is such a great voice, even though that's not Mark Hamill's natural voice, because he's gotten it to the point that he can even do voice cracks in that voice. If you can get to that point with a voice, then you have it down. Otherwise, I'd say proceed with caution if you're going to do a wildly out there take that you cannot keep consistent the entire time. It's why I also say have a lot of faith in your natural voice because your natural voice is something that is unique to you and nothing else can replicate it. It's the strongest asset you have. So no diss in your natural voice. Other than that, the acting out and the audio quality and stuff, just don't be a bad person. <laughs> I made this thread. You can still look it up on Twitter. You just type in audition etiquette. You can find that on Twitter. And I made this in response to a casting call I did once that basically said, my, my dev, my client, went through a lot of grief because a lot of people were messaging them upset at the results or constantly trying to get updates from them and things like that because they wanted to know more about the casting call or they were just really trying to get this part. And it actually complete, almost completely turned off my client to public casting calls. And that's something I never want to do. I want to give actors the chance to surprise me, to meet people I've never heard from before. And, you know, I don't want that to go away. But I also don't want my clients to be uncomfortable. So if that's the route I have to go down, it's the route I have to go down. So I made this thread to basically say what you should and shouldn't do when it comes to auditioning. Some of the things I mention is do not say these things. Do not mention you will do it for free. Do not ask 
why they didn't cast you. Don't guilt us into wanting to play them because you really wanted to play them. And this one is more specific, but don't just try to like constantly send stuff to get it right. So I'll go down each of these one by one. The offering to work for free thing. You probably heard this a lot. Do not offer to work for free when it comes to any sort of creative media or just anything where you will be getting paid because it just undermines the people around you and yourself. If you think about it this way, when it comes to products, say you're selling two products. One is more expensive, but you know that's also got a shirt quality to it and the person is trusted. And the other one is free, but you know nothing about it. And sure, the free one might be enticing, but what if the free one completely falls apart or if it doesn't actually work? And if you complain, you're just like, hey, you, pay, you get what you paid for, which in this case was nothing. So if you do not charge or you do not take the payment, then you are undervaluing yourself. And did you really get the part legitimately if that's the way you're going about it? Is by saying, hey, I'll work for free. Okay, it's great you work for free, but you don't have to. And did you really actually get that based on your merit as an actor? Other stuff is saying things like, uh, I really wanted to play it, or so I didn't get it, or asking for feedback. Basically, that, also, that goes into the realm of do not ask us questions related to how you were doing or whether or not we like your audition, because that's not really something that we are meant to do. When it comes to casting, I listen to so many auditions and I'm not able to pull them off the top of my head. I've, given, I've been asked many times for feedback on an audition when the person did not get cast. And my big response is just, I don't remember. And furthermore, when it comes to auditions, how you do in a specific role is not indicative of how you are as an actor. Most of the time, if you didn't get cast, it wasn't indic indicative of your acting ability or anything about you as a person, chances are you just weren't the best fit out of all these people. And that's not indicative of anything, which is why I don't really like the idea of asking, what could I have done better? Because oftentimes it's have a completely different voice to what you already have, which can be a bit crushing, but know that it's not anything based on what you can improve upon. You're doing great, and you not getting cast in this one thing is not indicative of your staying power. I've had some specific instances, the one specifically where it says, can I send it until I get it right? That was a very specific instance where somebody messaged me asking if I thought their audition sounded good for the character. And I said, well, I don't really know. I haven't heard it yet. And they were like, well, just can I just keep sending stuff until I get it right? Because I really want this part. And that just wouldn't be fair to everybody if I did it that way. So... I told them, you know, I can't really do it this way. And it's not really fair to, for me to just hear this because I'm not comparing it to other people. Auditioning is something where I have to compare it to other people, so I also know what works and what doesn't work as well. And there's also been times when people are just straight up hostile about the casting process. And they are upset that they didn't get cast in any of the roles. And they take that out on the dev, or they take that out on the person who got cast. And that's just not a good look. Because if you are acting hostile, or if you're acting in a rude way to somebody who works in this field, do know that you will be remembered, and not for the best reasons. Because casting directors, devs, and even voice actors, they are a very tight-knit community, and word will get around if you are difficult or hostile in any way. So just generally avoid doing that. I will say, though, if there are questions you ever have about a casting call or something that's not really being answered to you, then you can ask that. I often have in my casting calls a link to my Twitter so that if you do have any questions, I can answer them for you there. Because I know sometimes not all your answers are going to be there. No matter how many details you can lay out, sometimes you just have a specific inquiry. And in those instances, I like to have a place where people can go in order to ask. So I've told you about the what not to do, but there also is what you can do. So a couple of things that you can do to have better audition etiquette, for one, is first read the document and see all the details that are in there. And that way, hopefully, your questions will be answered. And like I said, if your questions are not answered by the document or something confuses you, for instance, sometimes people are confused by what it means when I say, 
line A1, line A2, line B1, line B2, or some variant of that. Basically what that means is when you do your takes, do the entire set of lines in one take, and then do this entire set of lines in a second take separate. And sometimes that's just confusing or, you know, it's hard to word that the best way. So if you need clarification, then just feel free to ask. When you send your auditions out, do something called send and move on. You may have heard of fire and forget. I, you can use that too, but send and move on is basically once you send your audition from there, move on and move on to other things, audition for other things, or just don't think about it. I know some people want emails that tell them whether or not they got cast. The way I see that, if you are constantly getting rejection letters or rejection emails like that, it can hurt your psyche. The nature of the business is that you automatically expect a rejection. So why do we need confirmation? <laughs> Which is why I often recommend just when you send the audition, just move on to the next thing and don't think about it. Don't ask for updates or anything like that because we're over here on this side just trying our best to get all the audition stuff in and listen to as many people as we can. So we want that process to go as smoothly as possible. You can also wish the project the best and wish the actor who got cast the best regardless of what the results are because just being a nice and pleasant person goes a really long way. I have heard many times in this industry and seen it myself that you can be an incredibly talented a-hole, but if you're an a-hole, no one is going to want to work with you. Meanwhile, there are people who may not have the best acting abilities, but they are good people who are directable and are willing to listen to how to improve and put in the effort for that. And those people go a lot longer of a way. I've certainly seen that happen, and, you know, industry professionals keep saying that. So it doesn't matter if you're not the best actor. If you're always willing to learn and listen and be supportive of people no matter what, people do notice that, and it's going to go a lot longer of a way than any amount of talent you may have. Oh, hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, we remember the bad, but we also remember the nice and pleasant. I actually have had instances where somebody um, enjoyed our project so much that we actually were constantly trying to find ways to get them involved. And finally, a rule came along that they were perfect for, and we jumped for the chance to have them. Because if they are genuinely interested in what we're doing, we are more likely to want to have them aboard. And finally, at the end of the day... Remember that casting is not a personal thing. I said this before, but whether or not you nail an audition is not indicative of your staying power in the industry. As somebody who honestly does not get cast that much, but you know, still auditioning and still doing classes and still doing things like that, casting is not indicative of your ability. I remember before I started casting, I was like, why am I not getting cast more? I know I'm good at this. But then when I actually did it, and I realized I had to listen to all of these files and listen to all of these amazing people who could do the role great, but at the end of the day, I can only pick one. Me not being the one didn't mean I was not good. It didn't mean I didn't have a chance. It didn't mean any of that stuff. So know that casting is not a personal thing. I mean, unless you've made it personal by being a bad person, but, you know, chances are that's not what's happening. And if it's not the audio, and if it's not that your acting could have some work, those are always things that can be improved. There are always ways that you can improve and just keep on going and keep doing your best, all that jazz. Whether or not you get cast in this particular role is not indicative of whether or not you'll be cast in the next role. So no matter what, when it comes to auditioning, just keep going. The right thing will come along for you eventually. All righty. So, that was my presentation. I'm going to uh, turn off that stream now, and I will get ready to answer your questions. Question, can I request the PPT for further lecture after the event? Sure, I can share that to you. I will DM that to you later. Quick question, if you have the option, do you suggest having looking at auditions on CCC off? I would recommend that because personally, I don't like having that open because the way I see it, you're just going to use that to compare yourself to others. And if you see that like count under an audition that is not yours, that might be, make you self-conscious. Plus, 
when you compare it to other people who are doing well, you don't know how the casting director or the dev themselves think about that audition. I remember for the Zelda Universe one, um, I think it was the Wind Waker dev that we cast for this. We had auditions that had a lot of likes. And that made us feel pressured that if we didn't pick those people, a lot of people would be upset or that they would be upset because they got a lot of likes. The likes are not indicative of whether or not we like them. It's just indicative of whether or not other people do. But at the end of the day, you're the one casting. So, yeah, you're the one casting, so it is up to you whether or not that's the one you want. I basically direct message... <laughs> Okay, let me see. Spam, spam, and so on. How do we improve then? Aw, oh, thank you for the summary presentation. How do we improve? Um, Tazdev, if you are here, may I ask specifically what you mean? You don't get the chance to audition? May I ask what you mean by that? It can be a good performance, but as casters, you know better than the general public what a better fit would be, so those likes on CCC can be deceiving at times. Yeah, exactly. You can have an audition that has a lot of likes, but you don't know the reasons why someone would have those likes. So that's not indicative of anything, and why I don't really recommend, why I don't really recommend that. How can I expressions down? I don't audition frequently. Well, honestly, the best thing to do is to just keep auditioning and keep experimenting. One of the great things about auditions is that it's just suggestion. And I've often had many instances where I may have something in my head, but that doesn't mean that's what I'll go with at the end. So really, just having fun with an audition and saying, hmm, let me try it this way. Have fun with it because we will also remember the ones that are unique. I know a lot of people have, like, folders of unique auditions that they've heard, and that sometimes also leads to the person getting cast. So don't worry about formality or following things. Go with your gut and go with your best feeling, because you never know. It could be what the person wants. Much like humanity in general, we don't know what we want until we hear it. And your interpretation can be something we may not have initially thought about, but then when we hear it, we're like, I like that. I want that. All right. Tips of writing your email template for when you send email auditions, what should be included in them? That's a good question. So definitely include the file. Definitely want to include the file. Also, I'm currently looking at the server events chat. Can everyone tell me if, or can somebody tell me if they can at least still see my face? Thank you. Oh, okay, 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 I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Sp thank you for the spam. Spam is underrated, by the way. Okay, so yeah, writing the email audition. Um, mention that you saw the project. I've done this um, in some auditions. I see a lot of things. Some people go really in depth. You can like include a link to your website so that if we want to, we can look further on there. I recommend not having too much stuff, just like a simple message, like saying, good luck with your casting call, or I'm really excited to see how this comes out, or, I, hey, I've included my file, I've also included this stuff and my resume. Don't flood it with too much information, because at the end of the day, you can include your resume and stuff, but when it comes to an audition, the audition itself is the resume, because it doesn't matter what you had before or what you've done before. All that matters is how you do on this one audition right now. So that's what I would recommend you would do. Just make sure that the auditions are there, and it's a little, give me a little nice message. How to come up with an audition track? Does it need to be edited or just looking for raw? Um, you don't really need to be raw. I mean, the closer to raw, the better. But if you want to do a little bit of cleanup, like cutting out any breasts and stuff, like I've noticed before that if auditions have a lot of dead space, it can feel like a drag. And when we're listening to so many auditions, we want to make sure we can keep things going as fast as possible. So cutting out dead space is good. You can also do some noise reduction, like basic noise reduction, but the closer to raw would be better, I'd say that. Yeah, listen to a lot of likes in one rule, not that great. Yeah, certainly happens. 
Uh, I will not give you name, age, pronoun, social security number, mother's maiden name. I mean, Jacob Wilson, 23, he, him, won't give, and won't give that either. What do you recommend audio file formats? Without the directors having specific instructions, do you prefer sending WAVE or MP3? What hurts in bitrate? Hurts in bitrate, I don't really think too much about. I'd say just as long as it sounds good. We can have a more specific thing for the project itself, but we just want the audio to sound clear. I do say I recommend sending it in MP3 instead of WAVE, just because WAVE files are so much bigger than MP3. And having it as MP3 will be a lot easier for the person downloading it and moving things around. Hertz and bit rate, uh, 2448. Why not? Let's go with that. But for the most part, I would recommend you go MP3 over WAVE. I love to have this response for this typed out. I will do my best to write it down. Oh, I'll do my best to write it down later, unless Phoebe wants to do that. Oh, thank you. That would be great, yeah. I think someone just knocked at my door. Oh, uh, you know, answer them. Are you asking me to type it out? 24-bit, 48k hertz. Sure, that. <laughs> and do you guys have any other questions? I could also tell you specific casting stories. Like how I, um, sure. Let me tell, okay, I'll tell you about story time is hot. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's so sick. No, what Nichols' question was. Are you asking? Oh, okay. I'll tell you about what probably was the most challenging role to cast for. So when it came to Witches and Warlocks, we had two non-binary roles. That was my first time ever casting for non-binary characters, and that proved to be a challenge because if you're casting a, a male role or female role, you already have ideas in your head of what that sounds like. You know, there's signifiers and things like that. But when it comes to non-binary, the thing with non-binary is that non-binary doesn't have a sound. You know, some people love to say that it's androgynous or that it's in between, but that's just not true. Non-binary doesn't have a specific sound. And that proved to be challenging because I couldn't go off of any basis, and I probably had the biggest shortlist of any character before. Where usually I will have a shortlist of like 20, 25, this time I had a short list of 50, but I still had to pick it down to one. And that is where having the visual actually came in great handy for me because I got to compare the voices to that character and it really came down to just what voice sounded best to me coming out of this character. And that's how I made the final decision for that and how I ended up getting the great Caden Jensen to voice the character. All right. If you are casting, should you private a casting call if on CCC? I've had a people audition after a deadline. Um, I guess when it comes to after a deadline, it really entirely depends on reasoning. I've had some people message me saying, hey, I can't make it the deadline. Can I send it this? And if it's not too late after, I'll be like, sure, you can do that. Thank you for letting me know ahead of time. But if it's people who haven't warned you about this before or just blatantly sending it after, then you don't really need to acknowledge it. I mean, I don't take it too seriously when it comes to indie casting calls, but for the most part, um, if that's something that's serious to you, then you, can take, you should take that seriously. How do you organize auditions on email with shortlists? So what I used to do, I've been deciding new ways to do that. I've tried doing like Dropbox or things like that just to see which is the most efficient way I can do things. But what I used to do was I would take all the auditions, download them, and move them into a separate Google Drive. Sometimes I would separate them by characters into different folders. And what I would do was I would just delete them as I go. I don't recommend really keeping them because it's a lot of files on hold, but I would delete them as I go and then make my shortlist from the ones I didn't delete. And then from there, I would just keep uh, cutting them out until I made my final pick. Just don't accept those auditions. Yeah, that's, you can do that too. If the deadline's been. Someone is knocking again. <laughs> Dan, you're getting, you're getting doorbell ditched or something. Hmm. All right, do we have any other questions? I don't know. How long do you think we should go for this, Phoebe? I'm trying to think of some other casting calls and the unique ones up to you um 
Let's go for like 410. People to have any last minute questions or any other like specific stories. Oh, no problem. I'm happy to help. Honestly. Oh, yeah. Feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, I'm also a VA. Uh, if you want my opinion on certain things too, I can help with that. I'm also a director. If you have any questions on how to do things like that. You can also ask my perspective. I don't mean to try to avoid maybe controversial things, but if you want to do that, sure. Thanks for answering because I was always under the impression that you needed a professional audition to even send something. So know you can send a raw with some things edited and make it so much easier. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that is an interpret that's an impression that spread around a lot. And that's why I share that voice moto booth thing to be like, hey, see, you can have this and it can still sound great. It's probably easier than ever to make audio sound professional or at least, mm, excuse me, or at least make it sound good. And I appreciate that because I'm somebody who doesn't have the budget to spend thousands on a mic or a studio bricks. So to know I can't just record out of my closet and still have professional sounding stuff, it definitely makes it a lot easier. I've even had people who record with USB mics, but they're very good with their space and how they use it. So you can even use a USB mic and make it work for you. Professional is a trick word, truly. Controversial question is mayonnaise an instrument, and it can be an instrument if you believe in it hard enough. Any horror stories with a certain person on CCC? Uh, I won't name the person, but I definitely have had a somebody who's auditioned for my stuff, but they're also a racist. So anytime I see their audition, I just skip over it because, you know, we don't mess with that sort of thing. Um, I haven't, th I thankfully haven't had a lot of horror stories when it comes to that. Like I said, that one casting call where my client almost went fully into private because of the actions of a lot of people, that's thankfully something I didn't see myself. But that definitely makes me very cautious about things in the future, which is why I also made that thread to just say, hey, avoid these things. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> jo oh, God, Joshua Walters. Not him. Phoebe, why? <laughs> why are you going to mention him? <laughs> uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, Joshua Walters. He was a voice actor. I used to actually be friends with him, and then he turned out to be a... Um... Am I allowed to swear in here, Phoebs? A shithead. He was a shithead. <laughs> he, was all, he was a complete racist. He was like a QAnon person. Just thankfully he's gone. So, yeah. Fuck him. <laughs> Talk your shit. <laughs> oh god, is this a tea spilling session? I don't want to... No, I can't spill the tea. People will be watching this in public. <laughs> I remember hearing a horror story of someone who got a fucking audition from someone whose email was a bunch of slurs. Oh my gosh, I got emailed once by this person who literally had um, the N-word in their title trying to audition for my project. They actually said to me, hey, that role you are casting, do you still have it up? And I didn't know what they were talking about because they weren't specific to anything. And it turns out, no, that particular casting call had been closed for some time. And then I found out they were doing this to another casting call, a casting director too. But they were using a lot more offensive language. And I was just like, oh, great. Yeah, public casting calls are really great for new talent. It's why I always want to go that route because, you know, sometimes people don't have a demo so that they can submit to a roster. But that doesn't mean that they're not talented. I know a lot of talented actors that still don't have their demo or anything like that. So to give them a chance in a different way is always something I'm trying to do. Which is why whenever I get the chance, I do want to keep my casting calls public so people can surprise me. Hey, not having a demo doesn't mean you're not great. Oh, couldn't find many auditions. Bro. Okay, how many auditions do you recommend doing a week or a day? Ugh, I need to get better about this myself. But I usually just audition when I see something that interests me. So it varies. I would recommend doing auditions, like set, set aside a day to do auditions and just knock all the ones out that you want to get out. I don't recommend spending too long on them. I hear some people say they spend like 10 minutes in an audition and I'm like, I can't imagine spending that much time for one thing. 
for me, if I don't get it out, then I'm going to overthink it and I probably will never send it. So if you have an audition that you really want to do, I'd say go for it as soon as possible and do your best not to overthink it. Do you have a blacklist? How do you add slash operate it? Is it shared around fellow casting directors? Um, I definitely have people I don't want to work with because of various reasons. I've never canceled somebody from auditioning because of personal reasons, because those are my personal things and that's not indicative of them as actors. So I like to avoid any personal squabbles unless it was something that directly affected somebody or they proved to be hostile to a work environment then I wouldn't want to do that. Although, for the most part, those people don't audition for my casting calls anyway, so it doesn't even matter. How do you enforce regular casting call instructions like no slating, certain audio type, etc.? What if someone doesn't follow it? Well, I just type that out in the instructions. And, I mean, I'm not really too much of a stickler, depending. It depends. When it comes to slating, actually, slating is actually a very interesting topic. If you're going to slate, I recommend doing that at the end and keeping it short saying, like, your name and then the character's name, and that's it. I've had some people who basically give me full-on dating profiles before their audition, and I'm like, fam, I haven't heard the audition for 30 seconds. I can't keep listening to this. i got to move on. So if you're going to slate, keep it short and move it towards the end, because we are on a deadline here, and we need to move fast. Oftentimes they say you wouldn't even need a slate, but if you're going to slate, definitely do it that way. Three lines takes me like 40 seconds. My sister told me, oh, you got cast in four projects. I think that's enough to start auditioning for paid ones. No, you can start auditioning for paid ones no matter when you want. When I got cast for Divine Speaker, I didn't have any other roles under my belt. Well, the only thing that I actually had was like some fan projects and I think one comic dub maybe. But for the most part, you can start auditioning for paid projects whenever. There's no gatekeeping to stop you from that. I mean, if your audio sounds good and you are, you're a good actor, then why not go for it? I don't like the idea that there's aspiring and professional, that there, there's levels to things, because, like I said, the audition is your resume. The audition is your application. That is the only thing that matters to whether or not you can do a good job in this role is how you do in the audition. So it doesn't matter who you are or where you're at in your journey. Go for whatever you want to go for. How much do you think someone should invest in a demo reel? Do you think a director is important? Would you recommend hiring a script or a mixer who isn't yourself? <laughs> Personally, as somebody who is going through, I often go through people who are trusted among the community. Like, I'm making a demo right now with Randy Greer. Randy's great. I highly recommend him. Director is definitely important because the director can experiment with you and get new things out of you. Director to a project... Yeah, I'd say having a director on your project is good. At the very least, someone who knows how to articulate what they want, because spoken direction can only go so far. Sometimes you just need a person in the room who can help. As far as how much someone should invest, well, I'm currently spending like $1,000 on this demo for the whole process. A good demo will cost you some money, just saying that. Um, there's different routes you can go down. Just know that a good demo will cost you some money. You don't have to spend multiple K on a demo, unless you're like doing a professional one, it entirely depends on what it is. Just make sure you are doing your research and you are vetting people. When do you think someone is ready to create a demo reel? It's entirely up to them. Whether or not they've been like casting a lot of things or if they feel like now's the time, I don't recommend rushing into that. I always recommend doing a consultation with the director, which is why I would recommend having a director, someone to do a consultation with you to know whether or not you are ready for one. Best Oz, both ones free and ones that cost money. I mean, you can do Audacity if you want. I'm taking advantage of the discount, the Adobe discount that I have for school. So I am using Adobe Audition, but, you know, that costs money. Um, I mean, if you want to go Pro Tools, you can. I'm not really best with DAWs. I've also heard good things about Reaper. That's really just a thing I recommend doing research on and looking at actual sound engineers. What method would you use to organize your emails? Well, I've, I mean, talked about how I, audition, how I organize my auditions. When it comes to the emails, well, the emails are entirely organized by what is said in the subject line. That's why I recommend having a subject line that people can follow, or at least something that makes it clear. Though oftentimes I will just make separate emails with the dev in order to have everything in one place. What's a good reason to upgrade from Audacity? Well, I was told to upgrade from Audacity because it was making my audio sound weird. 
But, you know, I remember Kira Buckland said that she still uses Audacity. I don't know if she still uses it now, but she definitely used it for a while. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with using Audacity for as long as you want. It's entirely up to you. I think the main reason, from what I've been told, why someone will upgrade to more expensive equipment is because if your stuff is more expensive, you can charge more for it and you come off as more professional in terms of a business. It doesn't really matter if you're doing character work, but if you're going to sell yourself as a business, then expensive equipment, I'd say, would be more important because you can also charge more and it just gives the image of being professional more, or at least more professional. Yep, Randy, great. Do you recommend sitting or standing when recording? I stand, I feel it helps me get into the mood easier. I never really sat down, but you can. I would recommend standing, but you can also sit if you want. It's entirely up to you what feels comfortable. Tips for preventing yourself from moving too much and creating clothing noises. Uh, don't really have this problem, but uh, keep your hands in your pockets, I don't know. But I don't think there's anything wrong with moving around a lot, getting yourself into the character, because voice acting is acting at the end of the day. So if you use your whole body to get into a rhythm or get into a mood, that's great. I say have at it. Tips to prevent mouth noises naturally. Drink lots of water. I have certainly heard the things about green apples and stuff. I mean, I've tried that. I didn't really notice a difference, but staying hydrated. That helps me. Best food drinks to have and ones to avoid. I'll be honest, I don't really pay too much attention to that. I've heard some things about milk, but I've had instances where I've eaten cheese before a session and I just kept drinking water and I was fine. So, drink water. I recommend that. I'm gonna pull through with these questions. I'm slaying right now. <laughs> Adobe, you a pirate. Oh boy. Luckily, I got it for free. Yep, I got the piracy joke. Yes. You wouldn't scream. You wouldn't steal from Adobe, would you? I mean, if you did, it's fine. They're kind of morally bankrupt. Bro, edited, then deleted. It's, what the f- did you, just, did you just send you? I steal it from the collage. I wish I had it when I was in school. Alright, I think I have, um, time for one more question. So, have I, although I think, um, if you guys do have a question, get one. Have a, no. I have one, all right, if you have one more question. Okay, y'all, no, I'm not telling you to steal from Adobe. <laughs> I mean, I guess like, I'll just say I didn't, I didn't suggest this, so I cannot be held liable for it. It's be about hanging out before the holidays, me thinks. I did not see it. That would be cool, though. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I, was, I had a great time with this panel. I'm glad you guys had so many questions to ask. It's a lot of fun. I'm glad I can always share my information. If you want, I'll actually uh, have a link to this uh, excuse me. I'll have a link to the PowerPoint. I'll post it in the server events chat. I'll, just, I'll send it to Phoebe, and if she wants, she can post it where she wants. Uh, do know, though, that because of the way I do presentations, a lot of it is based off of images that I will later explain. So if you don't know it at the time, I don't know what to tell you. But I will send it to Phoebe. Is that a... Let me check. Is that Cool Beans, Phoebs? Slays. Okay. Yeah. Glad you all had a great time. It was my pleasure. Hope you all have a wonderful day. I am going to... Oh. Before we leave, though, everyone check out my dog. Any cute? Grover. Hi, buddy. <laughs> hey, Grover, come here. I guess not. All right. It's great being uh, 